Welcome to our April 24th online service. We believe that God has good things for you today. Thank you for being with us and taking a moment to join into our service. If you're new to Celebration Church, we have a free book that we would like to send to you. It's a hardcover book written by Pastor Peter, and we know that it'll be a great blessing to your life. Just follow all the instructions on the screen. Also, we wanna invite you to our in-person service right here at 190 Railside Road both services. There's a 10.30 a.m. service and a 1 p.m. service. I know they will be a great blessing to your life. If you have prayer, please email us your prayer request. You can see that information at the screen, prayer at TICC.ca. In just a moment, we're going to go into a time of worship, and then immediately after that, today's message will be coming from Pastor Peter. So let's go there right now. Come on, somebody worship. Oh, the glory of your presence. the fact that you are with us, God. Wherever we go, you are with us, God. Hallelujah. For God so loved the world that he gave his son. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we worship you. Blessed is the one who comes
Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father, for your love for us. Thank you because we are the blessed of you. We are forever blessed. Thank you. Father, thank you for the prayer request today. Father, thank you for this son that you gave your son for. Thank you that you love him so much. Thank you because the deal is still on the table for him. We we'll pray now that you send people his way who is going to tell him about your love and that he will see Jesus and that he is going to turn his heart even to you. Father, we thank you for supernatural relationships coming his way now that the voice of your love becomes louder and louder and louder in his heart and darkness and lies are dispelled in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Father, we thank you for this family who lost a son of 35 years. Father, we know you love this family. Even now, as they try to process, process everything going on, we know in the natural, it can take time, but we have an advantage, and that is the Holy Spirit. We, we ask now that they will receive the comfort of the Holy Spirit, and their hearts will be healed, and joy will displace sorrow. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you that we know that you're present with them even now. In the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you for the provision of healing in Christ Jesus. Thank you because by his stripes, we are the healed of you. Thank you for your power that is at work in us, in this church family. And the power that is at work through us. And we pray in the name of Jesus, healing for the right shoulder now. In the name of Jesus, arms be healed. In the name of Jesus, wrist be healed. We'll pray now for healing in every part of everybody's body now. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, for this word who is written in. We'll pray for freedom from anxiety. We'll pray that Jesus is king in his heart. And on the increase of his government and peace, there's no hand in his heart. And that this person, we know that they are surrounded with favor as a shield, even in their business dealings, in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. We pray for the one who is trusting you for, for growth personally and in business. Thank you because you are God who gives increase. Thank you because you have declared unto us that we are blessed. We pray for insight and courage to take the next step. In the name of Jesus, thank you, Father. Amen. Let's, we're giving Jesus praise here this morning. Amen.
Let's take the communion elements that you received on the way in. If you're visiting with us today, I, in, I invite you to receive and partake with us if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus. Just take that element in your hand right now. I'm going to speak over the elements that we have, the bread, the cup, in obedience to Jesus Christ, who took the bread and wine and blessed it. I now declare that this bread and this cup is sanctified for the purpose of the Lord's table. In Jesus' name, amen. We're told to, when we partake, to proclaim his death till he comes. That's what we're doing here this morning. He has not come yet, so we're, 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 we're partaking. And so I want us this morning to, together, proclaim his death. Can we do that together? Say it with, take the bread in your hand right now. Say it with me. Say, thank you, Jesus, for your broken body. By your stripes, I believe that I am healed in Jesus' name. Let's partake of the bread right now. Thank you, Jesus. Let's take the cup, and would you declare, proclaim this with me? Say, thank you, Jesus, for your shed blood. I believe I am forgiven, cleansed, made righteous. I believe all grace and favor abounds toward me in Jesus' name. Let's partake of the cup now. Father, I thank you. Lord Jesus, I thank you today that indeed healing is ours, favor is ours, forgiveness and cleansing is ours. Lord Jesus, we celebrate you today and all that you've done through your finished work and through your resurrection, Jesus. We celebrate you. We love you. We thank you for your abounding love toward us in Jesus' name. And everyone said, can we give Jesus the biggest shout of thanks this Palm Sunday? Yeah. So good. Wow, 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 wow. Well, welcome to Palm Sunday. Welcome to Palm Sunday service. Look around, you find five people. Give them a big high, Palm Sunday high five and uh, tell them you're glad to see them here this morning. God bless you as you do. Morning, good morning. How wonderful is it to see everyone here on this little bit chilly but wonderful and, and Holy Spirit filled Palm Sunday. Good morning, good morning. So now that you're seated, let's take a few minutes and just welcome anyone who's here for the very first time as a visitor. So let's just give a hand for anyone who's here as a visitor. Yeah. And if you are a visitor with us this morning, we would like to invite you to our Welcome Center to get a book that was written by Pastor Peter. It is a gift for you. Okay, it is a gift for you. So after... Um, after the service today, there's a special, um, it's been going on for a while, it's, um, um, I just pulled a blank, uh, <laughs> Cafe Andrew, thank you, it's Cafe Andrew, and it's right after the service, it's a small, it's like a Bible study, it's intimate, it's wonderful, and there's lunch served there as well, so feel free to join, and everyone's welcome to join that, and if you have children here today, now is the time to bring them to, um, to the children's service, okay? Enjoy the service. Enjoy the service. We're going to, well, now we're going to receive our tithes and offerings. I was, as I was eating breakfast this morning, just before we give, it occurred to me. Now, in the scriptures, when, when, especially the New Testament scriptures, Paul, two of the main passages that talk about our giving, our tithes and offerings, 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. And in those chapters, it, it uses agricultural terms. It uses uh, farming terms. And it occurred to me eating breakfast this morning, can you imagine with me just for a moment that all the farmers globally, I'm talking Asia and Africa, South America, North America, Europe, and everywhere in between China, I, can you imagine if all the farmers got together this week and colluded that, you know what, this year, when they bring in their harvests, they're not going to set aside any, anything for seeding the next year. Now, initially, everyone, you know, it might feel nice because, A, there's going to be more food supply. I mean, you know, when farmers have a harvest, they've got to set aside a certain portion for seeding the next year. Initially, more food supply, that means lower prices for you and I, right? Plus more money coming in for them. So initially, you're what? Oh, this is exciting. But how many know if they don't set aside anything for seeding, they, and if everybody does that, 
How many know you and I, we're going to starve to death next year because if the farmers don't seed their seed, take a portion of the harvest this year, and so are we on the same page? I'm not trying to give an agricultural lesson. It's kind of basics, but, you know, imagine if the farmers colluded and they didn't sow anything. There'd be no food next year. You and I would starve to death, and the farmers, well, they would have no income, so it might be nice for a year. You know, Paul talks about our giving in such terms. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 10, go ahead and put up the first part. He says, now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food. So here we see him. Paul's talking about our financial giving. He says, our money, the purpose for us having money in our hands is twofold. Seed, to sow seed, and to eat bread. How many are grateful that we, have, we can eat, you know, use some of our finances to, to eat and to live and to enjoy life? That's a part of it. But a certain portion of our money is for sowing seeds or giving to the work of the kingdom. And can you imagine if every believer on the earth, like those farmers, colluded together and said, you know what, this year we're going to stop taking any portion of our harvest, we're not going to put any seed into the ground, we're just going to eat it all. And I mean, no, there would be no gospel work happening next year, because the work and the preaching of the gospel happens through our financial stewardship. And I highlighted that last Sunday, Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, the very first verse, doesn't mention the great apostles, Peter, James, or John. Doesn't mention even the author's name, Luke. It mentions a fellow called Theophilus. Maybe you've never even heard of Theophilus. But the very first verse of, the, of chapter 1 of Acts mentions Theophilus. So why is that, Nathan? It's because he funded the work of writing the book of Acts. And God par- shows us the priority of our financial stewardship. And so part of our income is for seeding. And then the latter part of that verse, go ahead and put it up, part B, that he might supply this, supply and multiply. Say multiply. We like that part. Supply and multiply the seed that you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. So from the portion that we take to, to seed into the kingdom, two things happen to that. Number one, God multiplies it. And that's what happens. We sow, we increase. God wants to increase businesses and, and, and careers and finances. But then the second part, the fruits of our righteousness. And that's the work of the kingdom. The scripture says that the Father is glorified when we bear much fruit. Say much fruit. And through our giving, we are bearing fruit for the kingdom of God. Amen. Father, let's just pray. Father, I pray right now that this revelation explodes in every heart. Lord, I thank you that you've given each of us seed today to sow into the kingdom, Father. I thank you that we have farmers' hearts, that yes, we can eat some of it, but Father, to see that the work of the kingdom, the great work that's happening through this church, Celebration Church, I thank you that it's being equipped through many, many farmers or sowers today, givers today, and through generosity, making the work of this church family possible. Lord, we thank you for everything that you've done this past year, doubling our missions giving, but Father, we look forward to greater days ahead in Jesus' name name. Lord, I thank you for multiplying incomes. I thank you for multiplying businesses, careers, opportunity in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Here's the ways you can give. You can see it all on the screen. It's all on one screen now. E-transfers online. If you're making out a check, do it to TICC. If you want to give by Visa or MasterCard, you can do it right on your envelope. Debit card machines available at the back, at the rear of the auditorium. If you're doing cash, that still works. Still works. Put it in an envelope. You can, envelopes are on your chair, and in a f- two, mi- two minutes' time, maybe three, the ushers will come and pass buckets down your aisle. Thank you for being strong in your giving today. God bless you. Let's worship together. <laughs>
Let's everybody stand up, you know. Uh, everybody got to stand up for just another moment. You know, I want to connect with, uh, with something that's already happened in the service. I was, usually when I'm preaching, I'm up a little extra early, meditating, praying, focusing, thinking, thinking about you, thinking about the Lord. And I felt the Lord speak in my heart and say, uh, don't think that healings just happen at the end of the service. They can happen right in the beginning. He just kind of, now I knew, I kind of knew that in principle, you know, but, but I just, he was just, sometimes we get locked into, we sing, we preach, and then we kind of do all the ministry. So, and I heard Tulu praying, here, where are you, Tuli? I was inspired, just felt the faith of God for healing. Then Pastor Nathan got up and he was taking the communion. I said, well, I'm just going to kind of pretend that everything in the offering didn't happen in between, even though that was very important that the offering happened. I, I'm just going to flow in that and just take another two or three minutes. I believe Jesus. Jesus is healing people here. I believe there's faith in this room. I, I saw a person here who has had, and this has been for several months, and you sort of seem to be able to shake it off in your lungs. It's like some infection, some pressure there in your lungs. And it kind of lightens a bit, and then it's there, but it never leaves you. I want to say Jesus is healing your lungs today. And, and it's been there for a little bit. It's been hanging on to you. So when, when am I going to shake this off? Well, it's coming off today. Praise God. And so, and then I, somebody's taken some kind of a fall. I don't know, it's, I think it's very recent, could have been this week or the week before, and you're kind of hurting. You know, Jesus is your healer. You don't have to wait till the end of the service, never mind to next uh, Good Friday. And by the way, it is a Good Friday coming up. It's not a bad Friday. It's not a gloomy Friday. It's Good Friday healing and communion service. But you don't have to wait. Jesus is here to heal you. Then there are other people with other things, other ailments, whatever it is. I just want to kind of pick up where Tulu and Nathan left off. They were, they were talking about how by the stripes we were healed. And then what I felt this morning when I was praying, so I say, well, I'm connecting here several things. Let's receive healing from Jesus right now. Uh, uh, who, who's that person who's had that pressure in your lung, that kind of thing that's sticking with you? Lift your hand way up high. I just want to know, yes, I see you right over there. I know there's several of you. Oh, there's quite a, I just thought it was one, but there's like 10 of you at least here. Uh, who, who's that person who took a fall and you've hurt yourself, you have some pain, you fell down, whether it was down the stairs or on the road or whatever, whatever accident of some sort? Jesus is here to heal you right now. And so we've already taken the Lord's table, we've taken the communion, and by His stripes we were healed. So I don't know what we're waiting for, but I just thank you, Heavenly Father, for the gifts of healing by the Holy Spirit. Lord, not only these that I mentioned, but every person here who is hurting. We are reminded, Lord Jesus, that you never said no to anyone. You never turned your back on anyone. You don't say to any, you didn't say to anyone, oh, wait for another opportunity. But it was always right there on the spot. And so in the name of Jesus, we receive healing now. We receive healing in the lungs, in the neck, in the heart areas, in the internal organs, the liver, the kidney. We receive healing and life from Jesus. I thank you for healing in the knees and in the in the ankle bones and in the hip sockets I thank you for healing in the internal organs Lord you know every part of it we receive it now in the name of Jesus give the Lord a big praise right now healing is here for you today and I always say you know whenever the Lord moves on us to pray early in the service it's better for you for you because you get more out of the rest of the service you don't have to sit there in pain and shift this way and shift that way and wonder when is this going to be over but you can enjoy it praise the Lord Jesus Christ is your healer and so I don't know what you think of that but you know just try it just say I, I don't know what to think but I'm going to receive from Jesus how many believe Jesus is healing you right now just wave at me I believe this all I mean if we had a healing service I guess if this was Good Friday maybe I'll talk to you more but I just see a lot of you who say God is good Jesus is my healer rather than clapping sometimes we clap to show appreciation and that's good turn to your neighbor and say Jesus is my healer then you go on and take your seat all right go ahead and take your seat amen amen thank you singers and musicians by the way you go and, and just uh, be blessed can you believe pastor Nathan that I can Alex can you give me that flyer there that's lying on the front row thank you so much I had it on my desk there it is and now I left it there well are you glad to be here today 
They tell us spring has arrived. I'm not sure. I walk by faith, not by sight. But uh, that's what they tell us. So I say, okay, whatever you say, whatever you say. You know, we put a little, uh, actually, I think it was Jermaine and Pastor Nathan, I don't know who all worked on it, but they put together a little flyer called Imagine More. Do you see that? Wave at me if you see that. Wave at me if you see that. Imagine More, Heart for the House. I think they have it on the screens as well. And uh, this is a way to say thank you. This is a way to rejoice in what God is doing And this is a way to give us faith to step out, take big steps of faith going forward. And so, uh, you know, if you look at the second page there, don't start reading it now because, you know, I'll notice and I'll be so depressed that you're not listening to my preaching. So this is for later on. But just on the second page, he lists some of the things that are, 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 we used to call them Arise and Build campaigns, and now we say Heart for His House. Everything that we have done through the years, started television stations, sent out missionaries, uh, you know, paid uh, towards this building. We have done so many things. And then uh, from page three, four, five, and six, uh, Nathan here enlisted uh, some of the things that we've been doing. I want to say again, church family, I'm so excited that we didn't sit still, but we stepped out and did something in spite of the things happening the last two and a half years. You can see there, we were training gospel workers in Myanmar, even during the Civil War. Put the screens up as I mentioned them there. And then you, we, we had we helped the food bank here in Flemington Park. You see that? And uh, that's the handsome Paul Cabina right there. Uh, you know, he's over here right now. Don't be proud now, Paul, that we just singled you out of all the people here. But, but Paul was a big help, but many others were a help, all right? And then outreach to indigenous communities in Canada. That's been a blessing. We kept doing that. We kept doing that. You know, COVID or no COVID. Then in, in Sumatra, 43 gospel workers have been commissioned and sent out. Isn't that great? You say, where's Sumatra? That's where the Sumatran tiger comes from. But there's people there. Uh, I think there's, there's like 80 million people or something in Sumatra. Then we were reaching out, partnership with persecuted Christians, helping, you know, in our whole ministry and the church is a significant part. I suppose maybe close to $40,000 went to help pastors get out of jail and, and help people that have been hurt and lost everything because of their faith. Are you glad for that? Then in East Africa, 115 graduates in the past two years who are going out. That's just one of the pictures because that's not 115. That's maybe half of them because we had another graduation. And then we launched a school in in Papua, Indonesia. Now, that's quite small. It's only about 12 students. Keep that in mind. Why is it only 12? Because it could be a lot more. I'll tell you a little later on. Then our school, we're helping over in India. Look at them. They all barefoot. I just noticed that they all bare feet. Oh, they covered it up. You can't see it. They all, that's India. How many are from India here? You know, I used to preach in my bare feet, but I don't do it here. But I did it in India. And so this is something. Now, we sort of imagine more, more vision, more salvation, more life, more miracles, more joy, peace, friendship, blessing. Everybody say, imagine more. All right. Now, that's enough. You don't, now, put it aside. You can read it later. All right. So I'm starting a teaching that we call... Um, your blessed life now. And let me read some scripture verses here. Ephesians 1, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us. So this is past tense. With every, not with some, we're not with a few, with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly in Christ. When the Bible says the heavenly, it's not talking about some celestial planet is talking about where God is, where God is the source. The heavenly is God sourced. And so we have preached on this verse many times, but I just quote it quickly here. It, it basically says that all the blessing we have look, looking for, a lot of people look, I, I want to be blessed. It actually has already been given to us. We have received it. Not that we've gone into, so we, I, I never ask God to bless me. I always thank him that he has blessed me. Uh, because once I saw this, I couldn't go back. I said, thank you, Lord, that I'm blessed coming and going. No matter what my circumstances look like, I'm blessed because of Christ Jesus. And then that, that becomes my modus operandi. From there, I step forward to receive. Then another key verse again, I'm not going to preach on this, but we have quoted it many times, Galatians 3, 14, that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham would come to the Gentiles. Gentiles, they're us. 
So Abraham is this archetype of a blessed person. It says he was blessed in friendship with God. He was blessed in cattle and silver and gold. He was, said he was blessed in everything, spiritually, materially, every which way. And so he is kind of a, a model put forth for us, uh, us. And it says here, because of Jesus, whatever blessing we read about this man, Abraham, it's ours. Everybody say, it's mine. And so what does the blessing mean? You can study all the Greek and Hebrew words, but I'm going to make it simple. This is not Bible school. We are having Sunday morning worship. That the blessing are favorable words and actions from God to us. So the blessed life, I put it like this. You can see it on the screen. A blessed life is walking according to the favorable words and actions from God on our behalf. God has spoken favorably on your behalf. That would be a good time to smile and say, that's good news. But he's not only spoken, he has acted favorably through Christ and what Christ did on your behalf. And so a blessed life, it, it, it is there. You have a blessed life, but the operative word here is now. My whole focus in this series will be on the now. You have a blessed life. Maybe you don't know it. Maybe you haven't experienced it. But God has blessed you with every spiritual blessing in Christ. So you have that. But the blessed life now is walking in that which God has favored us with by his word and by his actions. Amen? And so my whole teaching over these Sundays, it'll be a month from now, I'll teach on it again, and we'll pick it here and there. It's going to be now. Now. It's for today. You know, we heard a beautiful illustration, I think, last weekend. Uh, some of our, our guests said to us, you know, it's like you have an ocean above your head, an ocean of water, and then you have pipes tapping into that ocean, and then you have a tap. Now, you can stand under that tap, and you can have like a gusher all the time, 24-7, or you can just have drip, drip, drip. You can complain and say, well, there's not enough water. Well, it's about turning the tap because there's no limit on the supply. That's the way it is with what the blessed life that God has provided. It's like an ocean, but we can have to, it, it hit our head like drip. Is that all I got? Drip. Or we can just turn on the tap. So all the things I'm sharing is about turning on the tap, stepping in. And, you know, and we need it especially now because we've been so shut in. We, you know, they used to talk about old people being shut-ins. We have had two and a half years of people, young people being shut-ins. Pray for the shut-ins. Well, people have been shut in. It's time to step out. Can I hear a yes to that? So I want to give you some of the, every Sunday I'll give you, today I'll give you a couple of them. I say our response, the response is first things first. And another way to say it is, it's a very powerful principle. Put God first. What, is, what does that mean? Well, it, it's, a, it's a universal truth that goes as far back as you can. Well, what does it mean to us today? Well, it's described in types and shadows, for example, in the, in the Old Covenant. Let me read some of the verses, and then we'll talk about it. For example, in Exodus 13, 2, it's, God says to the people of Israel, Devote to me every firstborn, the firstborn of every womb among the sons of Israel, among people and animals alike. It belongs to me. God says, whatever comes first, I want that. Now, to those people, it was a law. They had to do it. To us, it's not a law. To us, it's an opportunity. We have an opportunity to step into it. Then it says, a few verses later, devote to the Lord every firstborn of a womb and every firstborn of animals. But every firstborn of a donkey you shall redeem with a lamb. And every firstborn among you you shall uh, you redeem also with a lamb. And so that's interesting here. So it says, you basically, the options were you were firstborn, either you were redeemed or you were sacrificed to the Lord. No other options. Everybody say the firstborn. That means the first. And you know, it's interesting if you leave that verse up there, you see it mentions a donkey. Do you know in, in, the, in the Jewish thinking, the donkey was an unclean animal? And I guess the lamb was pure, but the donkey was unclean. I, I guess it kind of carries through. Sometimes I've heard people say to another person who acts a bit stupid, don't be a donkey. I never hear someone say, don't be a lamb. 
You know, they said, don't be a donkey. You talk about stubborn as a donkey. You don't say stubborn as a lamb. You know, it's a kind of a, there's something about the donkey. And here's a beautiful picture. Because, it, it, don't get offended, I'm included. It's like in the, in the illustration here, we are all the donkeys. Look at your neighbor and says, don't walk out, don't be offended, because he includes himself. We are all the donkeys. Look at that. We're all those stubborn donkeys who act like a donkey sometimes. But even in the Old Testament, they said, well, when the firstborn of the donkey comes, that then is redeemed with a lamb. And that makes me think of John 1:29. Where John the Baptist says, you know, I see Jesus and I see the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And you have this pictured here. See, see, you can say that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes the place of all the donkeys. Hallelujah. And the donkeys can go free. The donkeys can rejoice. My sins are forgiven. So in that sense, Jesus is the firstborn. He's the firstborn Lamb. He is clean and spotless. His blood was shed shed as redemption. And, 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 and what well, you say, this is Old Testament. Well, I, I cover it up with New Testament scriptures. Look at this, uh, Romans 5, 8. God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You could say while we were still donkeys. God showed his love. He sent the firstborn. He sent his son as the firstborn even while we were still sinners. You know, that took faith. It took faith. God sent Jesus as a firstborn offering for the sins of the world. And, and nobody had repented yet. Nobody had said, yes, I'm coming to Jesus. Nobody had received it. And, and, and so Jesus there is our prototype. It says in, in, in Romans 8, 29, that he might be the firstborn among many. You know, the firstborn means the prototype. You know, when they build a new car, they build a prototype of that car. And that first car takes a lot of beating. They have crash tests and they do all things. But all the other cars, they don't have crash tests. The ones that come later. Jesus took all the heat. He went in the boxing ring with the devil and evil, and he won an eternal victory. Thank God you and I didn't have to go into that boxing ring. We would have been knocked flat on our, on our backs. But Jesus went in there for us, and he won the victory. Oh, thank God. He's the firstborn, and we follow in his, we are in his wind draft. This is the blessed life. We are in his wind draft. We, we're, we're walking with him. So you could say, and I put it here because it's so powerful, I wanted to put it in my own words. Jesus Christ was God's first fruit offering, firstborn. And then I put, God gave Jesus Christ in expectation of a harvest. Even Jesus, when he went to the cross, it says in the book of Hebrews, he endured the shame. He put up with all the blood and the gore. Why? Because he saw the harvest. He rejoiced at he, what, what he was seeing. He was seeing you and me and millions and billions of others who would have new life because of the pain and, what, and the suffering that he went through on our behalf, taking our sin and guilt and shame. Oh, this is so beautiful. That's the gospel. That's why, you know, we, we say sometimes, whatever of the first in our life, whatever, is, whatever the first in our life that we give to God, Put God first, we'll never lose it. But I think many have found that whatever comes first, whatever is first, and we hoard it for ourselves, we end up losing it. You know, Jesus kind of taught about that. He said, whoever will lose his life, lay down his life for my sake and the gospels, he'll get it back. But whoever tries to just hold on to his life and say, no, I'm not going to give her this up. It's, no, no, you end up losing it anyhow. Jesus said, you lose it. Well, that brings our thought to the Scripture verse, and I'm giving you a lot of Scriptures, but I know you're smart, you can handle it. Look at, look at Matthew 6, 32. It talks about all the things the Gentiles seek after. It says, Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. You know, we are all interested in things. I know you ladies, you want certain things, but men, you want certain things. For example, we, we had to get a new couch. I didn't think we needed a couch, even though when I sat on it, it kind of made noises, you know, it kind of sounded, look, it's been doing that for a year. I said, oh, Tiny, it's good for another 10 years. 
But, but she wanted to go. She wanted things. I, I said, oh, come on. It's all right. It's all right. It's sagging a little bit here to the left, and I have to kind of make sure I don't get a kinked neck or back when I was, but it's all right. But hallelujah. Yesterday, Tina was so happy. She was, I could tell she was extra happy for several days because she knew the couch was coming yesterday. And I, and I said to her, I said, yesterday morning, I'm still grieving because of that thing. I said, the old couch, you know, it's a good couch. She said, Peter, you got to get real. Are you with me? So, but, but then, so that's kind of, you know, women maybe are interested in certain things, men are, but you know, it, it overlaps because it can go in either direction. I'm just saying, how many want some things? Okay, you are too humble right now. You, you're not even telling. How many like to have some things? You, you're inter- come on, lift your hand. Wave. Come on, let's, let's not fool around. It'll be come out Sunday morning not to play games, you know. So it says here, Gentiles eagerly seek these things. But then it says, God doesn't say, well, stop seeking those things. You're just, you're just not going to get anything. No, it says, your heavenly Father knows that you need, this is the verse there, knows you need all these things. Your heavenly Father knows. And on this occasion, he sided with Tina. Oh, it was so wonderful. We sat on the couch yesterday. But then Jesus says, and here is for us who are believers, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given or provided to you. So it's not that God is against things. Some people make God says, oh, you can't talk about those things. That's materialistic. No, no, God knows you have, your heavenly father knows the things you need. But he says, here's a little truth for you. If you, if you just bring into the new covenant, this old covenant uh, principle of the first fruit and the firstborn, he, he says, if you'll seek first God's kingdom, what does that mean? Oh, it says really Christ's kingdom, his kingdom. It means that Jesus Christ is king. He has won the victory. I'm aligning my life with the king of kings. I don't see myself defeated. I don't see myself downtrodden. I see myself, no matter what my circumstance, I choose to see myself aligned with the king of kings. And he and I together are an unbeatable team. I'm seeking for that. And his righteousness, not my own. I'm not trying to make myself look good on the outside, but I'm resting in his righteousness. He says, Something will happen. The things that you need and the Heavenly Father knew about, it'll come to you. To some people, this is scary because it means prioritizing. It means faith. But seek first. You know, it said here, we read earlier, take the firstborn. You know, it would be easier if God says, wait till the ewe has 10 lambs and then you can give the last one. Kind of be easy, wouldn't it? Say, so, well, I got nine left. But it says here, there's something powerful in the firstborn. It's a, and we, could, we could read about this, and here's a principle. Let me say this first as well. You know, putting God first. The other, the other day, I think it was yesterday morning, we were up having a morning coffee, and I was sitting there thinking, Peter, are you putting God first in your life? I just kind of saying, I'm thinking. And I put in God first, and I was meditating on that. I was trying to be self-critical. and saying, am I putting God first? I was thinking, you know, in the times of testing in my life, that it has been difficult, but also easy. In times of testing, it may have been harder to put Jesus first and say, I'm going to stick with Jesus. But on the other hand, when you really test, you kind of, you kind of have to make that choice. You know, am I going to stick with Jesus or not? But when things are not so difficult at the moment, we all have daily little tests, but I mean, it's kind of going smooth. Then you have to stop and think. And I said, you know, I think I, think I am. I, I, maybe I could do more, but I think, I think in the decisions we make, and then all of a sudden, Tina's sitting there, she's reading the news or something, and I said, hey, I have a question for you. Is Jesus first in your life? She's like, what? What are you saying about I, I, I'm, I don't know what she was doing. Maybe she was playing Sudoku. I don't, I don't know. I don't know who she was. She was reading the news. I said, what, what? I said, is Jesus first? She was, so then she started to think. And she said, I, I think so, yeah. So, so that's, that, I'm not saying we couldn't do better, but I'm saying to you, think about it. And sometimes I realize when I went through my biggest tests, I kind of know I'm holding on to Jesus because the, the temptation might have been to quit. But even in everyday life, everybody say God is number one. Is number one. So, so here's the truth. The first portion is given to God in faith that the remaining portions are redeemed. 
That's a powerful truth. And, 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 and in the old covenant, that was by law. For us, it's by opportunity and by faith. For example, in Romans eleven six, 6, it says, if the first fruit is holy, the lump is also holy. If the root is holy, so are the branches. So there you have that. When you are saying in, 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 in the Old Testament, they said, I'm going to give the first, first to God, and then the rest is affected. For us, we know that all things belong to us, to Christ, but it's a declaration of faith. First things first. I've tried to live by that. I've been aware of that. And you know, it applies. For example, right now, according to our church calendar, or not just even the secular calendar, most calendars, today is the first day of the week. You know, to many people, Sunday is not the first day of the week. Monday is. They think, oh, Monday morning, I'm going to sit down and plan for the week, and this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to make some sales call. I'm going to make this happen. So to many people, Monday is the first day. To some people, Friday is the first day of the week. They say, ooh, Friday, the weekend is coming. And it's like, ooh, this is, I live for Friday and Saturday and Sunday. I do whatever. And then, oh, yeah, the rest. But, but to us as believers, this is the first day. This is where it starts. Now, I have things. In fact, I have about four things on my agenda tomorrow. I don't even want to think about them because that's tomorrow on the second day. But on the first day, I'm here. I'm so glad to be here to worship with Jesus Christ together with you. We are here, first of all, because the early believers, they, they met on the first day because Jesus rose on the first day. So that was the factor that changed the whole calendar. The Jewish people had taken the seventh day, but the church changed to the first day because Jesus was risen. And then they gathered on the first day. And there's something powerful. I'm saying, Jesus, I'm here, and I understand I'm not bargaining with Jesus. He has blessed my whole life. But I'm saying I want to be here also to demonstrate and say, Jesus, I believe you're with me Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. You're with me every day, and I'm here. One of the things I'm doing here, I'm meeting friends, I'm shaking hands, I'm listening to singing, and I'm having a good time. But I'm also saying, Jesus, if Sunday is holy, the whole thing is holy. If you are my Lord on Sunday, you are Lord of the whole thing. Amen. Are you with me in this? And so it applies to try education. Don't take this as a legalistic thing. I don't mean it like that. But you know, we say to people, we start in World Impact Bible Institute. I've told people this for years. Even if you say, I'm never going to be a preacher. I'm never going to be a missionary. I'm going into business. Maybe you could take one year just to say, I want to study one year at World Impact Bible Institute, just, it's kind of a year, it's about eight months, because you'll get so grounded, you'll have such a, uh, such a rooted understanding it could, in your career. You say, I'm going to move here, I'm going to do this. No, talk to God. Say, God, give me peace in my heart. Jesus, you're number one in our commitment. It says in, in Exodus 23, 19, the first of the first fruits of your land you shall bring into the house of the Lord your God. Wow, first of the first. This is the first of the first. Wow, there's a real emphasis on first. And you bring it into the house of the Lord. To us, the house of the Lord is not a building like this. We are not participating in sacramental religion. You know, sacramental religion is all religion. They believe that there's certain power attached to material matter, such as buildings. So they would believe that if we say we dedicate this physical building to the Lord, they think there's some divine power resting in these bricks. Many religions are like that. Some of you come from religion, those kind of religions. We don't think that. The house of the Lord is a house of living stones. It's us as a spiritual body coming together. But thank God in this weather, we have a building. How many are glad for that? I wouldn't want to sit in the parking lot because you wouldn't be able to listen to me. So thank God. For, but the building is not a sacrament. No, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Oh, praise God for that. And so, and so that, that's why we say we were concerned about the building. And in our case, this building called the Toronto Celebration Church. Now, lots of verses of this. Honor the Lord, Proverbs 23. Honor the Lord with your possession and with your first fruits of your increase. First fruits. The first. So your barns will be filled with plenty. And your vats will overflow with new wine. Well, you know, don't, don't worry about barns and vats because you don't have that. 
but the Bible was written to agricultural folks. So you may say, uh, my, my digital wallet. Or you may say, my actual wallet. Or you may say, my refrigerator. I, I just, there's something about bringing the first to the Lord. And see, there's a difference. Let, let me draw a distinction here between a, a religious law and a universal divine law or principle. I think I have that wording on the screen there for you. You know, for the people of Israel, they had like a religious law. You better. It was like a gun to their head. You better. Or else the priest is coming to collect. You don't bring those sheep in. They're coming to collect them. We don't have a collection agency in this church or ministry. How many are glad for that? No, this is, this is the new covenant. But what we're dealing with is a universal spiritual law. Because this predates anything that has to do with Moses. I'm not so interested in all the most things Moses said because the Bible says the law of Moses was for a limited time. I like to go back before that and see these universal things like prayer and worship and giving to God and what Abraham did. So let me give you one here. I think you'll catch something. How many are ready to catch something? This is a familiar story that has troubled many. It's about two brothers and the one in the end ended up murdering the other. Look what it says here in Genesis 4 verse 3. It says, in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Well, that's nice. He brought an offering. And he says, Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. But then it says, the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. He got mad. He said, what's wrong with my offering? And in the end, he murdered his brother. Now, people say, try to grapple with what that happened. Pay attention to the verse. Let's go back to the beginning of the verse. There's some wording here that I think if we understand the enormous emphasis in Scripture on the first, put first things first. It is a way that I respond to the ocean of blessing over my head and turn the tap on. It says, in the process of time, it came to pass. That means that Cain brought an offering. What does that mean? Well, he was working, you know, he was planting seed and he was reaping a harvest and, you know, he was maybe doing that. We don't know how long, maybe several years. And then in the process of time, a while later, he says, well, you know, maybe I should give something to God. I guess God created the soil and he causes the sun to shine and the rain to fall. So it's just kind of in the process of time when he had everything secured. You know, it came to pass. It was kind of down the line. He said, well, maybe, you know, maybe I, should, maybe I should give something to God. I mean, it, it make me look good too, you know, if I give something. I don't want to be a total pagan. But then Abel, it says, he brought of the firstborn. He didn't wait till he had ten little lambs. He took the first one. Now, it doesn't matter the way we give. You know what, whatever way you give, you know what we're going to do with your check? We're going to cash it and put it into the gospel. Can I hear an amen to that? We're not going to say, here's first fruit. This is down the line fruit. But for us, for me, this has become a revelation, and we try to practice that. I don't want to just say, well, you know, when everything's going well, and, you know, if I had some money left over after I paid for the hydro, and I paid the, the water bill, and I paid the electricity, and I paid the natural gas, and I paid everything else, then, you know, if I have something. No, I'm going to say, hey, you know, Faith. It, it, Abel had faith. He said, I want to give the first. There was no faith involved for Cain. It was, it was down the line. You know, it's about a hard attitude. It's like Abraham demonstrated that. You know, he, here's what I found. That when God is first, first. Everybody say it, numero uno. First. It seems everything else comes into order. But when God is not first, it seems like everything else gets into disorder. It's like, I, I can't even explain it. I have watched for over 40 years this principle, and it, it comes into disorder. And so when we talk about, for example, tithing, Pastor Nathan mentioned it, tithes and offerings. People say, what's tithing? Oh, it's giving one-tenth to the Lord. Well, you know, we're not telling people that you have to do that. But I'm saying strictly that's not the definition of tithing. Tithing is the first, the first, because it takes faith. 
not saying, please don't understand. I'm not mandating you, but I've found myself. It's so great. April is coming. Let's, if I could tithe for April in, in March. Some of you looking at me right now. You say, well, I'm not there. Well, maybe one week, maybe one day. It's just a blessing. To, and then I say, well, what if God prospers me more? Well, then I'll make it up as it goes. But at least I'm expecting something. You know, faith is a walk where you do what's, you, you don't have it. You don't have the other lambs. You don't know. Abel didn't have 200 sheep and 300 cows and 500 goats. You know, he, he just said, the very first, I'm just going to give it to God. Because if I, by, by, by that first, then the whole flock is blessed. The whole loot. Is, is this too much for you? Can you handle this? And, and, and you know, our church, I'm so glad for our church. Can I say thank you for church, family? You know, when we've gone through things like COVID, you know what happens? I've been in church life for over 40 years. Believe me, I know. I've been associated with some of the biggest and strongest churches in the entire world in my, in my lifetime. And I learned one thing, that when th- you, the last thing a church will do is give to the world, to bless others far away, give for missions, give for, that's the last. If things are really going good, they might do something. And when things get tough, that's the first thing they cut. You never have them say, oh, let's cut the pastor's salary 20%. That, that'd be good. No, they say, let's, let's, we don't need to be involved in that great commission thing. I'm so glad for our church family. Are you ready to clap for yourself? Not yet. I'm just going to brag a little bit more. Are you ready here? I, I thank God for the giving family. Hold it, hold it, hold it. Don't get too excited right now. But I'm glad for our church family. Much Thank God for our lead pastor, Nathan, who, who, who was just flowing in this. In fact, at times he was encouraging me. I, I, I always want this, but he was encouraging. Thank God that we said, you know what? Let's not do that. Let's go against the grain. Let, let's say we've been giving 10% to reach the world out of all the money that comes in. Let's go for 20%. We did that in COVID. It was really stupid. Can, can I be honest with you? It was stupid. Naturally. In the natural, I said, well, this be the time to kind of batten down the hedges. This is the time to, you know, just kind of hold on, hold on for dear life. It's going to be rough sailing. COVID, we're going through the COVID ocean. Let's hold on. We said, let's believe God. Oh, praise God. That's why we, we gave you this. You know, this, amen. And now we are stepping up. We're calling this heart for his house. Put, put, put the PowerPoint up. I'm going to get, I got to move fast. I'm talking too long. Heart for his house. Here's what we believe in God for this time. Go, go to the screen there. Uh, go to the next screen. Whatever is the next screen. I gave you two or three. Here. What we want to do, we want to help pay the cost of running the Toronto Pavilion and the things we need to do here so that the regular tithe can just go to ministry. We want to do more for children. We want to do more in many areas this year in Toronto. Can I hear an amen to that? So if we do some extra going for it, uh, for the building in this, that will put us over the top. Then, did you see, I said, look at the small little class we have in Papua. Do you see that? You know why? Because we know if we even dare to advertise about our school there, we would have 200 students. So so they said to me, well, we can't advertise. We'll have too many students. But the the, the teacher said to us, can we start just with 12? Because we get practice. We do a practice year. So I said, okay. Because we we said, we we, we want to help you get the building. We want to help you get the facilities. So they're running their school now like a practice year. Just with 12 students right there. Because we don't dare advertise. Because if we advertise, we're going to have an explosion of students coming. There's no place in Indonesia where we have seen such a continual openness. The governors in those provinces are my personal friends. I mean, they come and sit on the platform when I preach. It will be an explosion but we had to hold back and so we are saying this year this year I've been talking to them and they say yeah it can happen this year we're going to do it come on are you happy about that our church is there then 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 support Christians especially persecuted Christians in eastern Ukraine I haven't said much about Ukraine because you know one thing I know that you can send money here and there and it just get lost in a big uh, swoop of a big bank account and and so I said, I had to do some inquiries. And I'm able to say today, I have inquired because my burden was, especially in those places where now evangelical born-again churches like ours is coming under enormous attack. 
uh, that are occupied by, by Russians. We have found a way in, so we bring the goods, and we're going to bring some goods to the border. Then paratroopers, which is kind of not the army, but they're kind of tough guys, they're going to take it right to the pastors, and the pastors will give it to, their, to, to the people who have lost houses, who don't have food, and they're going to send us the receipt and pictures so we see exactly. How many are glad for that? So we're going to help out in that. What, what else are we doing? What else? You say, well, then we want to, we, we're launching We Be Toronto. We need some more tech stuff. We need to be up to date, you know, for, for a school here. And then I thought just to put a cherry on the Sunday, what if we could, in this campaign, uh, provide follow-up for 50,000 new believers? In fact, right now, we're trying to get for 400,000 new believers, so that would lower it to 350. If our church took care of 50,000, how many think that's concrete? Give the Lord Jesus praise for that. And so we're going to, quickly, quickly, we're going to receive the offering on, on January, uh, not January, June the 5th, all right? And we believe in God. Here's our goal. Put the goal up there. I, I can put a victory goal of 280,000, but then I said, that's not good enough. Let's go for an exceedingly abundant goal of 350,000. Give Jesus a big hand for that. All all right. All right. Are you ready for my second point? I'm moving fast like anything right now. Are you with me? So the first one, put God first. Second response is the gift of giving. You know, in Romans 12, there are seven motivational gifts. Let me read very quickly. Having gifts differing according to the grace given to us. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or serving, let us serve. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with generosity, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. There are seven gifts, and we call them motivational gifts. In fact, in the, in, in the school, I'm going to be teaching much more detail about this, but just to say, these seven motivations you find among people, we have them here. Prophecy motivated people. Let me, let me describe the kind of person. Maybe you're one of them, or you know somebody. Prophecy motivated people. They are very concerned with motives and sincerity. In fact, do you really mean it? You know, they're those kind of people. We need those kind of people. How many are glad for those kind of people? They're very concerned that, that everything we say is lined up with Jesus. That's good. Then you have serving motivation. Serving. I love servers. They are the people who, who just want to serve. Uh, they, like, they like to shovel the driveway. They like to do the garden. They like to bake uh, apple pie. They, they like to, when we have a food Sunday. I love those people. In fact, you know, there's one person in the Bible, her name was Dorcas. She was a server. She was making clothing, weaving for the apostles. So they got so sad when she died, they raised her from the dead. It's one of the few people raised from the dead. She was a server. She wasn't, she wasn't in, in the prophecy motivation. She was a server. She just wanted to take care of everything. Thank God for the servers. Can I have an amen to that? They just, they like to arrange chairs. Then we have teaching motivation. Some people have a teaching motivation. They're very good people. They love to study. They love to research scriptures. They love when we preach up and we start to explain Greek and Hebrew words. Ooh, that, that, that really, that, that, they want to have, you know, a concordance here and a study manual here and three different Bibles and different translations. And they love that. We love those people. Can I hear an amen? Then you have people with a motivation of exhortation. Oh, they're wonderful. They're not so much into study manuals and Greek and Hebrew words. They're just looking for someone who looks sad. Maybe you have a motivation gift of exhortation. You're just looking for somebody who looks depressed this morning. Hey, you go up and say, oh, how are you doing? Oh, I want to exhort you. God is for you. Whatever you're going through, God is bigger. Don't you love people like that? Oh, thank God. We need them all. Isn't that right, Pastor Nathan? Then, then some, said, some have a special gift of giving. Do it liberally. Do it you don't rush. They don't they give finances, but they give time. They give wisdom. Then you have leading, the ministry of leading and administrating. They kind of take charge. If you were in a, if you were in a multiple a car wreck by the road, and three, four cars, and, and a few people running around, you'd be the one taking charge. You say, you call 911. You check on the person here. You call the ambulance. You do this. You do this. It's just, you can just see them. I think we have some of those. Can I hear an amen? Then you have the mercy motivated way to make the one. They, they just want to show mercy. And they say, it doesn't matter what bad you did. You find a mercy-motivated person, they will say, oh, God will give you a second chance. He'll give you the 100th chance. The prophecy-motivated person will say, well, make sure they're sincere. But the mercy-motivated person will say, oh, God loves you so much. And we can, so we can say, now, the thing about these gifts, and it would take me hours to teach on them, is that some people have two or three that is really strong in their life. You may know. When I, 
But we all need all of them. We, we all need to be, have mercy. We all need to, to be, at least be able to teach people how to get saved. Can I hear you? We need to at least teach something, right? And, and so these are beautiful gifts. And, and, and yeah, much to be said about that. But we all have two or three maybe, a lot. But we all need all seven of them. And, and we need to take charge of something, take charge of ourselves. Now, in the Bible, when it comes to giving, you know, there's some big givers in the Bible, like Abraham. He says to Lot, take whatever part of the real estate you want. God is my source. David, poor shepherd boy, he prospers so much that he gives, end up in our, our, our value of money, gives billions of gold to, to build the temple. Paul was a giver. He rejoiced when other people did so well. Give it. So I want to say, uh, some of you say, I, I feel, I just love to see needs met. But we all need to grow in that. Can I hear an amen to that? And so, and so, you know, whenever we talk like this, and we heard about it last weekend, you know, they're business people. You are called to be a marketplace minister. Embrace your calling. You would think, well, Pastor Nathan is called to preach. He's, he's a, he is a, no, you have a calling. You have a calling in your career, in your money, making, in, 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 in you, you have, you're called of God. We affirm that, and you affirm that. Stop thinking of yourself as a non-called person. You are called. You believe God. You are a provider for the vision. Oh, come on. Somebody get excited about that. And so I'm going to quickly, quickly here. This is going to be so fast. You hardly, you really have to, don't even take notes. Get the CD because you're going to lose something. I wrote down some characteristics about someone who has the gift of giving, how they think. So I, I put them up quickly. Men and women have the gift of giving. Sometimes in a couple, you'll know which one of you has the most gift of giving. But you, but you just love to meet needs, so you do it together. And I, another thing I found about people who are serious givers to God, they gravitate towards strong vision with clear objectives. Did you see that? Strong vision, clear objectives. Because they, they want what they do to count. Whatever money they give, whatever time they give, they want it to count. They want results. You know, I've met several people. I know many people who have a gift of giving. We had them in our church. In 1997, I think it was, a man called our office, and he said, I read Peter's book on, on the end time harvest, the people coming to Christ. I want to, I want to give some money. Well, you know, sometimes people call like that. They don't really mean it. So he called a second time. And then uh, he said, do you ever go to Florida? I was just going to preach in Florida. He said, well, I want to be in Florida. Come and see me. So he was in this uh, trailer home in Trailer Park. Nice home, but he was in his primary home, but he was there, holidays. I went to see him. Just the most unpretentious person. And, and when he left, he said, I want to give you a check. He wrote me a check for $100,000. That was U.S. dollars, which was good at that time. I said, all right. I said, is this real? I said, let's take it to the bank. I want to know right away. Because I've had some that weren't real, you know. It's kind of embarrassing to go and say, hey, it was real. Then in the next five years, he probably wrote 20 more checks like that. He just loved it. He, and he said to me, Peter, you know why I'm giving you so much money? He said, I've been giving to all kinds of ministries, but I give more to you than anybody. He said, I said, why? He said, I look at it like if I had racehorses, and, and I would put most money in the horse that runs the fastest and is the strongest. I could have been offended if he called me a racehorse. But I understood. I understand people with the gift of giving. He wasn't trying to, he wasn't trying to make me look bad. He was saying, you get more done. You win more people to Christ. You get more people saved than anybody else. So I'm going to put my, my money. He said, you're my Kentucky Derby winner. I wasn't feeling like he was, you know, being bad. I said, I, I understand. He has a gift of giving. Some of you are looking at me strange. Just tilt your health a little bit. What's he talking about? And, and, and so that, that's, a, that, that's kind of a, people like that can be frugal and generous all at the same time. They kind of want to budget. They want to know what you're doing. But, 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 and, and then it can be frugal. You know, frugal, frugal, frugal. They don't want too many things. Uh, you know, there has to be urgency. But, but, but they can spend a lot. Are, are you with me? So that's why we like budgets. Come on. I always say, get this cheaper. We're printing for 400,000 new believers. Can we, can we cut 10%? And, and we tell Jacob, contact them. Say the, our missions board, which is Nathan and I and my dog together, we, we say we need a 10% cut. And then they go, oh, we got 10% off. We say, hallelujah. We stretch the money further, and then we pay for it. Are you with me? 
Oh, come on, don't look like that now. Then appreciation, but not recognition. You know, people with a gift of giving, they want to be appreciated. Can you imagine this week? I, I, they, they call me and says, this lady, she, I had mentioned, I just mentioned it briefly, that we're going to a stadium meeting, and I said, just a stadium rental, and the, and the, and the sound system is about $11,000 a night. We're going to have many nights. But, and somebody had heard me say that. I don't know who it was. Just sent $11,000 in. Here's for one night. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to call that person and say, thank you. No strings attached. I mean, appreciation. That's, you know, I, I kind of have, I'm kind of a giver. I like to give. I, 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 but I like appreciation, but I don't have to be recognized. You don't have to say that I did it. I, I just like to do it. But I like serious. One man came to me and said, he said, I need $80,000. I'm building this and that what in Philippines. I said, do you have a budget? No, no, budgets don't mean anything. I said, well, what are you going to do? Oh, money means nothing. Just give me the check. I resent that. What do you mean? Well, money means, anybody who is so foolish as to say money means nothing, don't give them one dollar. Because money means something. To me, you know, once you can take care of your own breakfast and lunch and supper and have some clothes to wear and a place to sleep, money is, is, is a tool. Uh, to, to reach the world for the gospel. So don't tell me it means nothing. It means something. And then, you know, whenever we talk like this, you see, God wants us to know that he is interested in things. He's interested in this. But there's always, when the God wants to show us something, there is a satanic counterfeit. There's, there's trying to, to distort you. And so, you know, I think God wants to show us that he wants to bless you. You're in this church. God wants to bless you. God wants to prosper you. But there's that counterfeit poison of some hyperactive prosperity, self-centered, and it turns everybody off. But I refuse to throw out the baby with the bathwater. I'm going to believe God and we're going to prosper, not in a selfish way. You're going to prosper. This church is prospering by the grace of Jesus Christ. Amen. It, it, and it's not about control of money, but good stewardship. People like that don't want to control. They want good stewardship. They, and, and I put nothing, they want to invest in stable ministry, not in a sinking ship. You know, some people, if somebody says, oh, our ministry's going under. If you don't help us now, oh, if you don't help us, we're going under. We're shutting the doors. Some people respond to that. Those who have a gift of giving don't respond to that. They don't want to be a part of a band-aid. They want to have a cure. <laughs> they don't want to support a sinking ship. They want to support something that's stable. That's what I'm telling you. We keep telling you, we're not a sinking ship. We're doing good. But we're going to do even better. Praise God. You know, one time a, a person came to me, a man came to me and said, he'd been attending the church. And he said, this was years ago. He said, oh, Pastor Peter, I love your preaching. I'm here every service. I love it so much. And I want you to know that I'm a giver. Oh, I said, that's wonderful. But then he said, but I don't give to this church. So I said, hold on for a moment. You come here every Sunday? And we had morning and night services, yeah? At that time, he says, I come here every service. I love your preaching. Uh, but, and I'm a giver, but I don't give anything to this church. Oh, I said, what do you give? Oh, he says, my cousin has a church. But he only has 10 people. And if I don't send my tie there, they're going to have to close the doors. I'm saying, you know, it would probably be a blessing for your cousin to close his doors. Uh, maybe he's, a, you know, some people aren't supposed to be doing it. Are you with me? If the church is all about covering the pastor's salary, maybe they should have a home group and be a part of another church. I'm so glad in our church, you kind of get a world. Have you noticed even? I mean, we, we show you stuff. We're doing this in Burma. We're here in Indonesia. We're doing this in Africa. We're here and there and everywhere. And we up with the... That's good for your children. They don't come to church with, oh, we've got to help the pastor. The past, the pastor is hurting. No, they, you got to give your kids a church where they get the right idea. We are taking the world. Hallelujah. That was the vision I got in the beginning that TICC wouldn't be like a snow shovel. You know, some are shoveling a little snow. And that's how some churches are. They're shoveling a little bit snow, a little bit, you know, a little bit. We are not a, we are not a snow shovel. We are a big plow. We're like a plow coming down the Don Valley Parkway, and we are over here, and we are spraying there, and we are spraying here, and we are, oh, praise God. That's the right, that's what, oh, give Jesus a big hand. Praise God. I have so much to say on this. Okay, forget any PowerPoint. I'm running out of, of, of time here. It, it, it's, it's so much. It's, and, and people who have a gift of giving, don't criticize people who are successful. Somebody said to me, there was one brother in the church, he was prospering, and they said, oh, we should pray for so-and-so. I think, is he sick? No, we're going to pray that God keeps him humble because he's doing so well in this business. 
So I said, well, you know, it says that God exalts the humble. Maybe he was already humble already, and God has exalted him. That could be an idea. I said, maybe, I didn't say this because I'm such a nice man, but I, I had it on the tip of my tongue to say, maybe you should pray that you stay humble. <laughs> you know, maybe. Anyhow, are you with me? And so we celebrate. We're glad. We're glad that God is blessing you. I'm applauding you. I say, hallelujah. You're a marketplace minister. I, I thank God for you. Oh, give Jesus praise. <laughs> okay. okay, one more verse. I, I'm almost done here. Are, are you with me? Are we having a good time this morning? I got You know, when Paul finishes his whole teaching on giving, he finishes with one little tiny verse, and he says this, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Everything he taught about giving is wrapped up in this, God, God has given me an indescribable gift. I have become generous because my God, he gave a gift. I can't describe it. I try. I write epistles, Paul would have said, trying to explain it, but it's beyond word what God has done. He loved me in spite of myself. Jesus took my sin. He took every shame. He took every murderous thought out of me. He made me a new creation. It is beyond words. It's fantastic. It is ooh la la. It is awesome. It is beyond words. And he says, everything I do and teach you about giving is wrapped up in this. God gave an indescribable gift when he gave Jesus Christ. Oh, I want to make sure that you know this, Jesus. That you know that your sins are forgiven. I want to make sure of that. It's awesome. Everybody bow your head for a moment right now. Just go ahead and bow your head. If you say, Peter, I'm not sure that I know Jesus. I came here as a visitor, and you're talking about challenging the church, and that's what I've been talking. This is not our normal Sunday teaching, but once in a while, it's been a couple of years since we talked along this line, but it is super important that you're here. You came, and you heard, and you say, well, I want to receive the forgiveness of sin. I want to receive what Jesus has done for me. Well, then, you can turn the tap on. You can receive it. While every head is bowed, if you say, Peter, I want to receive new life. I want to receive the forgiveness of sins. I want to come back. I want to have been drifting. I want to come back. Would you give me a signal by lifting your hand? And I'm not going to call you to the front today. Sometimes I do. But I'm going to include you in this prayer. And we're going to pray it together all over this room. If you say, I want to receive this. I want to know my sins are forgiven. That I have life with God. Lift up your hand way up high. Let me see how many today. God bless you. God bless you. How many others in the back over here? God bless you. All right. Several of you. Yes. Let's pray together. Would you say, Heavenly Father, thank you for your love, your indescribable love. I receive it now in the name of Jesus. Lord, live in me. I lay down my life and I receive your kingdom your righteousness in Jesus' name. Amen. Give the Lord a big praise right now. I can't tell you this, that we have a booklet for you. I don't know if it's Elena, who it is, who's running the welcome table. You can go and receive it there. And then come on this weekend. We're going to have a great time on Friday and Sunday. But let you stay where you are for a moment. Look at me right now. How many have received something this morning? Just two things we talked about first. God first. God first. Everybody say God first. Amen. That's why I never like when politicians say their country is first. I may like the politician, but I don't like whether I, I ever say God first. Say it again. God first. It's a universal principle. God first. It seems things come into order. Faith is involved. That talked about the gift of giving. And now, there is a certain concern. Paul said to the Galatians, I fear for you. I'm afraid. If you're not going to step it up. Well, I'm not afraid in the sense I'm fearful, but I realize we've gone through a time when everything has been about withdrawing, pulling back. It's like pastors say, oh, I don't want to challenge the people. I'm just happy if they show up. <laughs> you know, because this has hit churches hard. I thank God for our church. So I feel a compelling. Let's step it up. And so I'm going to ask you in these next 
seven, eight weeks, whatever it is. Let's take care of this. Would you help us do the things that are listed there? Help with the expenses of the church. Help with that Bible school that we've been kind of having a trial year because they wanted to get started without telling anybody. So we started, it's running, there's some expenses. It's going to go, whoa. And our school here. And helping those believers, now that we got connection, that we can send the material through these paratroopers into that area where believers like us are having a real tough time. And we can do it through the pastors. How many think that's a good idea? That we empower the pastors and the leaders of the church. And they can share it with non-believers. They can share it with anybody. But, but they have the opportunity to share that. And then new believers. So would you uh, make sure everybody receives this response? Or put it up there. In fact, you're going to receive it. Ashes, quickly, quickly. Give it to everybody. And so we are asking people in this time. It's been several years. Can you imagine? We haven't done this for several years. And all the good it has done for the 20 year history of this church. We wouldn't be here without these campaigns. We call it Heart for His House. Imagine more. So I'm asking you today to take this. I want to make sure everybody gets it first. And then we're going to just pray because this is something holy. Tyna and I have already decided to get involved, but of course I knew I was going to ask you to do this. So we had time to think about it. I want you to think about it. I'm not trying to emotionally motivate you. I'm not trying to manipulate your emotions. I'm not saying to you, we're going under. Help us. Hallelujah. You know, there's something about giving. And I want to say to you, I appreciate you. Look at me right now. I appreciate you. I appreciate every person. You know, appreciation is something very powerful. You know, how many have noticed that Pastor Nathan and Megan have two children? How many have no Give away with me. Well, you know, years ago I had this thing. I would bring candies to church, and I would stand by the door, and I'd give little candies to all the kids. You know, all the kids wanted to come to church to meet Pastor Peter because he had a candy in his pocket. Even parents that didn't want to go to church, they would make their mom and dad come because they wanted to have a candy from but then I stopped because people got so scared about candies and Halloween and you know so I was thinking maybe I didn't do it anymore but then I thought I'd try it on on his two kids so a little while back I started to bring a treat every Sunday every Sunday I bring them a treat now if you want me to include your kids I might have enough treats to include them just a little not anything big nothing big and so I sent them a message two days in advance I'm bringing a treat little video and they come running to my office. And would you know, a few Sundays ago, I had forgotten the treat. Now, they're so well-trained kids, they just came and looked at me. They didn't say anything, but I knew what they were thinking, and I knew what they were thinking. You messed up, Pastor Peter. And they loved me so much. Nathan tells me his daughter says, I don't like school, but I love to go to church. And she says, I want to see Pastor Peter. You know, I have, I have some clothes and shoes there in, in my little study. I have a tiny little study. She, go, she goes to my shoes and says, Jesus' shoes, size 13. She said, so, so you know, so now I'm thinking, how am I going to get out of this? Today I had to bring them treats because they're expecting it. I'm thinking, how long will this last? At what age will they outgrow this? Because I feel like I can't let them down. How many know what I'm talking about? I, I feel like I have to bring something because they'll stand there well-trained, disciplined, and they just look at me. You failed me, Pastor Peter. So their appreciation makes me want to give a treat every Sunday. So this morning, even though I had many things, I come with a little treat. I was thinking, you know, I like to look at God that way. Say, God, what do you have for me now? God, and he looks and says, you're always wanting something more. You're always imagining more. But it's like God can't resist. How many know that if I can feel that towards uh, Nathan and Megan's kids and Tyna, of course, is over. Said, Did you bring the treats? She asked me, do you have the treats? I said, yeah, the treats are in the bag. And she's kind of like, you get the treats. If, if, if we can feel that way, remember how God feels towards you. Are you with me? All right, let's pray. You know, to me, I looked at this and said, you know, that would be wonderful, some folks who could give 35000 We need about 
10 of those people, 35,000. But if we didn't have that, if we could have people who gave, 50 people who gave $7,000. Or we could have people who give $70. Or people could give $700. Kind of all divides by seven, if you go for that big number. Or, or we could have people give, some could give 70 every week. Some could give it once a month. Some could, some could do one big amount. Put, put it up again on the screen there. I just say that, you know, I, I, we, I appreciate you. I appreciate that. I mean that. I'm not trying to butter your pancakes right now. I mean it. I appreciate that Pastor Nathan and I are able to have a church that has not pulled back during COVID. I mean that. I appreciate that. Take that to heart because I'm talking about you. Give yourself an applaud now. I set you up for it. I, I, I appreciate that. Thank God for that. But I'm saying, let's not be stuck in that. Let's go forward. So you think what, what don't, don't, you know, faith is you know what you could do. I kind of know, Tyna and I know, we could do this. It would, it would mean something, but we could stretch. We could kind of, in faith, do something. Let, let's, has everybody got this one thing right now? Let's just fill it out after we pray. I want to collect these in a moment, and there's an envelope beside you. Many want to give on this Sunday. We're not going to preach like this over the next seven, eight Sundays. We'll just remind you we are in the heart of the house campaign and then we'll have regular services. But now, now is the time where we're saying, let's make that commitment. And so let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you. I thank you for this gift of giving. I thank you for this principle of God first. And I thank you for faith rising in our hearts right now. In the name of Jesus, I pray for the Toronto Celebration Church that it will go to heights we never dreamed possible. I thank you for our vision for this snow plow, this, this not, not a shovel, but a plow, a big, broad plow for the kingdom of God. And I thank you for every single person being blessed as a participant. In Jesus' name, speak to our hearts, God. I believe when we, amounts are coming into our mind. Speak to our hearts, God. Speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So there you see now, we're going to collect these in about two minutes. I know I'm running over time, but we only do, haven't done this for two years. I commit to give over and above my regular giving. And then we're going to collect these. So fill it out right now. Just start writing. Just start writing. Ashes, if you get ready, I'm going to pass the bucket and you can write an envelope and you put heart for his house or H-F-H-H. -H -H. Put that on the check. H-F-H-H -H -H, or heart for his house or just put house. House. That's easy to remember. And let's do something big for God. And I want to be able to, I'm going to ask Pastor Nathan tomorrow to see what has been committed, that we can rejoice together. And you know, people say, I don't want to make a commitment. Well, that is the strangest thing. You know, we make commitment to rent an apartment. We can't rent an apartment without making a commitment. We can't say to the landlord, you know, ask, ask the spirit leads. No, they say, sign up for 12 months here. I want first and last month rent. Well, can we do that for God? Can we do that for Jesus? Of course we can. Of course we can. And that's why I love to fill it out. So I kind of have a reminder. I'm believing God by June the 5th. That's the Sunday of Pentecost Sunday. We're going to believe God. We're going to rejoice together. Amen. So go ahead and fill that out. Let's just pray a little bit more. Come on up here, Pastor Nathan. I want you to stand beside me. Here we do. We're standing together with all of you. Believing God for great things. Whatever. Maybe you can do $10 a, a week. Or, ten, or maybe you can do $100 a month. Whatever. You put it right there. Nothing is too small. Nothing is too big. The main thing is that everybody, young people, you get involved. You say, well, it's too small. No, it's not too small. Everybody starts somewhere. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Are we ready? Are we good to go? Are we good to go? Have you got this? Wave it at me if you got it filled out. Amen. Now, if, if, if you are with your spouse, you better look at what they wrote. I don't want to have any family quarrels over this afterwards. So just look at it. What, are you, what is going to be your step of faith? What are you going to do now? Give the first board. Step out now. Maybe you don't have it yet. You will have it. 
Amen. Let's do it right now. Let's fill that out. Come on, give me some million dollar music there on the piano. Oh, thank you. That, that's it. A little bit more, a little stronger. We're going to rejoice and the buckets are going to come and then we're going to just, I know this is a long service. Normally we're done by this time and we will be next Sunday, I promise you. But let's give this right now. Come on, ushers, if you want to go ahead and pass the buckets right now and come on up here, singers, and you just fill out what God has put in your heart to do and you do that and we're going to rejoice and tomorrow we'll know and we'll be able to tell you that we are on our way to a great campaign, Heart for His House. And we're going to be showing you the pictures of what we're doing in different parts of the world, what we're doing here. And I, I'm so glad for the way that the Lord is guiding us and helping us in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Come on up here, Jermaine. Let's do that song. I love that man, that man of Galilee. We have prayed for the sick, but I want you to stand and I'm going to do one closing prayer. Everybody stand up right now. Stand up. Even if you're in the middle of giving, some are using the debit machine over there. Everybody stand up. Put your hand on your heart. How many are currently employed? Lift your hand if you have employment. All right. How many of you are looking for employment? Some of you are. How many of you have your own business? Okay. How many of you would like to have your own business? How many of you are not sure what you want? All right. How many would like to have your own business? Raise your hand. How, how many have your own business? Let me see. All right. Lots of you do. How many are employed? Let me ask you again. All right. How many say, I'm not employed, but I'm working as a volunteer. I'm helping out in God's kingdom. Lift your hand way up high. That's wonderful. We need that a lot. Put your hand on your heart. Father, I believe the reason we have been prompted in these weeks to focus on the marketplace minister that it's a calling, whatever job and career people have, and we need to embrace that. We are focusing on this by your spirit. And now in the name of Jesus, I pray for every person in this church with faith to embrace that. We take it to ourselves. It's not just words we hear. We take it in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to rejoice. We're going to dance and shout. And Thank you for being a part of our online worship service today. Just as a reminder, if you are new, make sure to request your free co uh, copy of the hardcover book written by Pastor Peter. If you have a prayer request, please reach out. Let us know. We would love to be able to have the opportunity to believe God with you. As a reminder, we, we welcome you to our 10.30 a.m. service and our 1 p.m. service. Uh, lastly, we just want to remind you that we believe that God has good things for you and your family this week. God bless.